it, funny enough, it hit me. I, I stepped off the podium, you know, after being awarded my individual Olympic gold, that 200 free gold. And it was like, what now? You know, where do we go from here? That's that's the next question. How do you how do you top that? Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, home of all things British swimming. I'm your host Scott and back as always is my good friend Dan and on this week's show we are joined by one of the standout swimmers of this summer and last year's Olympic Games. Heck, let's just say the last 18 months in the pool. Yeah, I mean, for this episode, we're delighted to be catching up with a previous guest of ours. We always enjoy it when we bring back a guest to chat about how they've got on since they last came on. And there's a lot to catch up on, especially when they've become Olympic champion. Absolutely. So please welcome back onto the Propulsion Swimming podcast, double Olympic champion and British superstar, Tom Dean. Tom, thank you for joining us. How are things with you? Really good. Thank you very much for having me, guys. No problem. Now, we're we're kind of recording this a little bit later than planned because anti-doping came around. Um, Now, before we get into the podcast, I kind of want to know what what is anti-doping for the the uneducated? So, basically, you know, as you kind of get on the international stage a little bit more, you get, um, you're you're required to say where you're going to be staying every night, as in your overnight accommodation. You have to fill that in for the... uh, the, the WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, um, big database, you have to fill in where you're going to be training and what time, and you have to say where you'll be for a certain hour of the day, you know, you have to be in that location for at least an hour every day. So I just do like early in the morning, you know, I'll say I'll be in, in my house, whatever. But this was an out of hours test, so you can literally rock up to your house any time of night, knock on your door, if you're there, they say, right, you've got a doping test. And for me tonight, sometimes they just require a urine sample, sometimes it's blood and urine, so tonight it was, it was both so... They come in um, just in my living room uh, and they sit down. They, you have to fill in you know, form after form. You have to give a blood sample. You have to provide a urine sample, which has to be over a certain amount. It has to be over a certain um, like strength as well. You know, it can't be too dilute. Um, so it's very, very much got you know stick to these strict guidelines. Uh, and then you know, I think it was about forty-five minutes all in. Um, you know, from from them arriving to them leaving. But it's an important part of the sport, and it uh, makes sure that you know everyone's held accountable, which is good. So, so they can turn up at any time, any day, at any yeah, any time. Um, let's say you've just gone to a the toilet then, and they ask you for a urine sample. What, what happens then? They just wait until you need to go again. So basically, that's happened a few times. So I might nip to the loo before I go to bed. So I nip to the loo, right. get into bed, just about to fall asleep, bang on my door, right, doping test. And I'm like, well, what, what am I doing? And you've just got to sit with this bloke in your living room, just waiting, waiting for you to, to need to go to the bathroom. Again. And you can't drink too much water because then the yeah. sample will be ty- too dilute. So you literally, I've had it him sitting in my living room you know, we're just chatting for about an hour and a half, you know, just having a catch up. But it's like <laughs> late at night, you know, just because you're trying to, you know, make sure you have enough, uh, you know, to, to give a sample. So, yeah, uh, sometimes they do catch you at bad times. Oh, man, it's all fun and games, oh, wow. but a little bit of insight behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> so last time we spoke to you on this podcast was before the final of ISL in 2020. So since then, obviously, quite a lot has happened within the space of swimming, within your own swimming career. So let's start off with the most obvious thing. You've become Olympic champion from Tokyo, which seems a long time ago now. But how does it feel when people still call you the Olympic champion and you get to call yourself Olympic champion? Yeah, goodness me. So 2020 ISL finals, a long time ago. Yeah, the Olympics, it was crazy and it still is slightly crazy to this day. The Olympics channel, the official social media channel posted a comparison actually of the 200 freestyle mm. from from Beijing and Tokyo and I'm like oh I can't wait to watch this and I'm like oh wait I'm, it's going to be my race and, you know it's just like <laughs> I'm like actually yeah no it was actually me who's on that race and because I, I look at it like obviously as a swimmer and a massive swimming fan I've always been watching the archives you know watching mm. you know Thorpe in 2004 watching Phelps in 08 and Yell you know watching the the Rio 200 free and then it's just it's almost surreal that you know 
the Tokyo one is 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 my race where I won. So it is a little bit of a, a pinch me moment, even even now when people say you know Olympic champion. And I said like I've given interviews in the past and said it's like it's something you dream of as a young kid and a young swimmer. The pinnacle of the sport is being an individual Olympic champion, and mm. then for it to finally happen, you know, for me it was always you know that year it was like I just want to make it to the Olympics. I would be so over the moon if I could make it to the Olympic Games, and then it was like. Oh, my two and a freeze kicking along, we could have a solid four by two. And then it got to the trials and I went like 144 and it was like, okay, 144 wins medals at major competition. You know, this is this mm. is really hotting up a little bit. And then it was a few days before the actual race where Dave was like, as in Dave McNulty, my coach was like, look, you really need to start wrapping your head around winning that two and a three. You know, you need to start thinking about it. And then it happens and it's just like, you know, I'm sure we'll get on to talk about it, but it is your whole world getting flipped up like, upside down. But, you know, to have that tag Olympic champion at the end of end of my name is, is still so surreal. And, you know, I, I could not ask for any more in, 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 in my sport, in my career. You know, it, it's, it's brilliant. And, um, yeah, still slightly surreal, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, has that title actually fully sank in at all? I mean, you're being compared to Phelps, like you just said on YouTube. Has, has it sank in at all? <laughs> I know, it's nuts, isn't it? I'm watching it back and I'm like, oh, I wonder who we're going to see in this race. I'm like, oh, wait, no, it was actually me who found that race. So, yeah, it is It is a little bit weird. It is, It is. yeah, I don't know. It is slightly surreal. Um, mm. You know, I've got the I've got the medals just upstairs in my room and stuff. And, you know, every time I, when I go and do talks or whatever it is or, I, you know, visit school and I get them out and look at them, I'm like, that's all I ever wanted, you know, to hold one of these as a kid. You know, it's all a young swimmer dreams about, you know, um, it's like I was, I was speaking to a friend of mine, George Taplin, earlier, um, who we, we trained together. And we were saying, you know, when you're a young kid, and like all your mates are, oh, when are you going to go to the Olympics and that stuff? I remember I used to go to the barber shop and the barber would be like, I'd be like, you know, 13, 14, oh, when are you going to go to the Olympics? Stuff like that. And then you go and you win. And it's just like, it's, you know, you've achieved you've achieved all you've ever, you've ever dreamed of in the sport. So it's slightly surreal still. It's probably the best way I, I could put it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure so much has changed from you since that happened and we're going to touch upon a lot of it. Um, how has it changed in the pool to start with? So in terms of racing against other competitors, do you very much feel like a watched man now compared to before? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's, that's undeniable. But it's something I was ready for because it's something Dave, my coach, very much prepared me for. You know, As soon as I finished... You know, I didn't race for months after. I think next time I raced was, I think, ISL. Um, you know, months and months after that. And he said, look, you know, every, t- every time you step on the block from now on till the day you retire, mm. you'll have a target on your back because you're the Olympic champion in the 200 freestyle. You know, that that's undeniable, especially in this Olympic cycle because you'll be, at that time, you know, current reigning Olympic champion, um, you know, from, from now to Paris, you know, hopefully after Paris, well, that'd be quite nice, but definitely between <laughs> now and Paris. Um, so there'll be very much a target on your back. So, you know, it's when you walk out to a race and they announce, oh, uh, an in lane four double Olympic champion, Tom Dean, it carries a certain weight with it. And there's, there's on the one hand, there's an expectation to perform uh, and there's, a, there's a, a degree of extra pressure. But the way I see it, you know, I'd much rather have that pressure because it means you've done something to warrant having that pressure in the first place. And, and I think that's a, that's a great position to be in. And I think it almost plays into your advantage and plays into your hands slightly when you, you're able to carry yourself um, more in a certain way when you've got these results. You know, I've always, I was always like a confident athlete in the cool room, but now you have, you know, these results and this accolade uh, and this tag on the end of your name, you know, Olympic champion to really, um, you know, fully complete that confidence almost I think it's the best way to to put it um so yeah it is it is definitely changed my uh expectations heading into race but but um it's something that that I I do quite enjoy actually Mm. so would you say it's now harder because of that extra pressure on yourself and extra media pressure as well uh I think slightly um you're always under uh, the magnifying glass slightly more but then on top of that that's even better because if if I do have a good meet then it's like there are more eyes watching it. Obviously, it, it, it makes you know the bad me slightly more um, slightly more extreme. Like you know, between the Olympics and Christmas, I raced and I didn't have a great winter racing. You know, that's undeniable. I just didn't didn't swim that quick. I hadn't trained brilliantly. I didn't prepare. You know, I had such a long break after the games. I was never going to race that quickly. And you know, that's that's more under the spotlight. That's more under a magnifying glass because of it. But 
you know, I just knew that was going to be the case. And then when I went to Commonwealth Games, and I had a, I really enjoyed Commonwealth Games. I was, you know, so happy to walk away with the the medals that I did. Then you know, it's Olympic champion Tom Dean, you know, wins wins seven go- uh, seven medals at a uh, Commonwealth Games, which is which is really cool as well. So um, I don't I I don't think it's made it made it harder. I think um, I think it's it, for me it's only brought positives. Mm. How much changed outside of the pool for you? Where there's was there suddenly loads of media requests? Were you doing talks? Were you um, ambassador for any new charities or new kind of um, initiatives? I'm sure lots went on and. Did that kind of impact on your training at all over the last 12 months? Did you have to change anything because of suddenly this title carries a lot of weight? You've got a lot of talks and a lot of inspiring to do for the next generation. Yeah, it is a bit nuts. Honestly, I can't lie. Like, I think between now and 18 months ago, I think because I've kind of got used to it in the last 12 months, it's a bit more standard. But like, if I went back and told myself 18 months ago, you know, this is how it's going to be after the Olympics, you know, like at the end of the day, we've got to remember we're swimmers, we're not like, you know, footballers or anything like that. So when mm. when you get stopped in the street, that's unusual for a swimmer. You know, we're not yeah. we're not actors or movie stars. You know, and after the Olympics for four months straight, I was getting stopped in the street every single day. Like a day did not pass. I remember I got back to the Olympics because we flew home early because um, obviously we couldn't stay because of the COVID regulations. So the Olympics were still going on. Mm. I flew back on like the second of August, and on the third of August, I was in uh, London for something. I think I was going after dinner. I can't remember what it was, but I was sitting on the tube. And this guy opposite me had the, the papers that they give out on the tube, you know, the free ones. He's in the sports mm. section. And there's this massive photo of me winning my gold. And he was looking down at it and he kind of looked up and then looked back down, like took a few double takes. Because <laughs> and, 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 the Olympics were still going on at that time. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, you came over and said congratulations. So, yeah, it was being, you know, stopped and recognized is, is incredible. That summer was like unlike I've ever, ever experienced anything in my life, you know, so many people, um, which is brilliant. Everyone's so friendly and so complimentary. And, you know, I think it's not one of those sports where you have like, you know, like if you're a City player, Man City player, and, you know, someone from like United comes over, you know, they might, you know, be a bit aggressive and stuff. It's it's a sport in swimming where it's it's, it's a real positive community, which is very nice. Everyone's been absolutely lovely. Uh, the demands of my time, yeah, they've definitely ramped up. Um, like you said, a lot of talks. I, I do um, keynote speeches and stuff, which I've always really enjoyed. And this has allowed me to do more of that, which has been brilliant. Um, stuff like uh, awards evenings, you know, like last summer I was going to like, I went to like the GQ awards and stuff, which was crazy. This was like two months after the Olympics. I was, we, Team TV won an award and we're backstage and I'm standing next to like Stormzy and stuff. And I'm like, how on earth <laughs> That's did a like... world. <laughs> yeah, this is from swimming. This is from like what was my hobby as a kid, you know. And now I'm like, I just got this award off Idris Elba, and now we're backstage, and like, <laughs> crazy movie stars. So that oh, was like a bit nuts. of a pinch me moment. And then, and then on top of that, you know, the commercial opportunities. Like mm. I had to get myself an agent and stuff like that, you know things I'd never even thought about. You know, he's brilliant. Uh, I'm so glad that you know I met um, my agent Hugo. Um, you know, he, he really really helps me and and. Um, I've been able to do kind of a lot of work um, off the back of what he's found me and stuff like that. But then that is more demands on your time, like you said, and, yeah. and, and you know that's all time away from the pool. And Dave's brilliant. He's understanding that you know we are in the sport swimming where the financial um, gains aren't brilliant, you know. So you need to do a bit of work where you can, and you need to try and earn some money as and when you can. So he is lenient in that he'll allow me time away from the pool if a commercial opportunity arises, if it's if it's you know worthy of time away from the pool. But I have to make that session up elsewhere. You know, I have to come in on my afternoon off and do that session. So that's the trade off, and we've I think we found that sweet spot between balancing the the training and the mm. commercial. Has he vetoed anything so far? Because I, I mean, there's there's been a lot going on. I think I saw you with what was it Kem from Only Way as Essex oh, doing yeah. a little thing before the Commonwealth <laughs> Games. Is there anything that he said? No chance, Tom. You're, you're not. Doing yeah, it. the way we do it. So it's me, my agent Hugo, and Dave. And if something comes along, it has to get a tick from all three of us. You know, and it has to get the green light from all three of us. And that's that's the the process we go through. Um, mm. That means something, right? Hugo thinks it's a good opportunity for for whatever, you know, commercial and, and you know, it, it portrays a good image. I want to do it because I might enjoy it and I think it's a good thing to do. And then Dave, okay, it's worthy of missing a session and we can make it up here. So he has to get those three ticks. Yeah, I think he said no to a few things, but um, they've been things like I'm fully in agreement because I understand I need to train as well. You know, I, I, yeah. I am also the athlete and I know the demands and 
So I think there are a few small things, you know, as we're getting close to trials with Dave, it's like, you know, it's, it's too close. You can't be missing an afternoon or you can't be missing a day for stuff like that. And, um, you know, when I've asked for like a whole day off to go and do filming somewhere, you know, it has to be worth it. And I have to be able to make that session up. Mm. See, this, all this, this stuff has happened to you so young. I mean, every, I, mean, I, I imagine every, your average Joe in the street would probably sort of crumble, crumble under all this pressure, but you seem mm. to be embracing it. I mean, I, how how are you getting over it that 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 well? Yeah, um, it was a bit. It, I think it really hit me in those first few weeks post Olympics, like I said, because it was all the commercial stuff and trying to find someone to help me out and, and manage all of it and you know all the crazy like I had this big street party when I got in and then like a thousand people turned up you know from the ta from Maidenhead from the local town you know getting stopped in the street. The, the pressure to put my family under them getting stopped and stuff like that you know that was a bit that was a bit manic. But I really, really enjoyed it at the same time because it was just so cool and everyone was so friendly and lovely and, and um, really, really nice. I think it's settled down a little bit more now. Um, it, the, the real test was going to be that summer of racing that I've just done to see how mm. I was able to bounce on, you know, and, and um, I had a good chat with Bill Furness, the, the head coach of British Swimming, and he said that, um, you know, very few people who win the Olympics are able to medal the following year mm. a, a, a world level competition I mean you look at some swimmers who won the Olympics and didn't even qualify I know there's there's you know one or two um, American swimmers who won an individual Olympic gold didn't even qualify on the team the following year and, and yeah. is that a question of you know maybe they let the you know they didn't have a coach that kind of reined in on the commercial things or maybe they didn't have someone that was really looking out for them and like you said the pressure and everything got too much for them because it is it is a lot to take on board i've been in a fortunate position where i've got you know a great group of people around me and be able to keep pretty level-headed and you know enjoy it and enjoy all the perks that it brings but you know at the end of the day like i'm happiest when i'm working hard in the pool and i'm, I'm training hard and you know i'm seeing the benefits and I get up early and do my session and you know feel tired and go to the gym you know that's that's what i'm most used to so that's what i wanted to get back into i bet it's really hard to keep the motivation going as well because essentially everyone wants to be in the sport of swimming to win an individual olympic gold that's what you said earlier mm. on now you've done that kind of so early on at your career it is that motivation to keep pushing and keep going to the next one have you found that that's a struggle at all this year or is it literally been like you said level-headed great team around you that has kept you pushing uh i think that's a really good question so it actually hit me it, funny enough it hit me I, I stepped off the podium you know after being awarded my individual olympic gold that 200 free gold and it was like what now you know mm -hmm. where do we go from here that's that's the next question how do you how do you top that? And I think for like two months after the Olympics, normally I take like a few weeks off and I'm like, oh, I probably get back into training now. You know, I feel I feel that itch to get back into the pool. I was like taking another week off and then another week off and I didn't want to go back and another week off. And I think part of it was actually, well, what am I, what am I training for? You know, isn't the Olympics next year? You know, I'm not gonna be able to defend the title. You know, I'm not, that's not happening for another few years. You know, I've done this, I've, I've won, I've, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm getting all these, award shows and stuff like that you know it's quite enjoyable and it's like well why get back in and just batter myself in training you know i think i i didn't i didn't i almost didn't want i didn't have that drive and it took a good few months for that to really come back and that itch to really and i think i started to see some people racing somewhere it might have been at the isl the one i didn't go to at the start mm. i remember seeing some people racing i was like, actually you know i i want to i want to get stuck in i want it, i want a bit of that as well and, and then i was like okay i need to get back in and start and start training again so yeah it was a real a real tough period um, in terms of motivation, but I think that the big driver for me was like, I've reached, I've done the pinnacle of, of the sport and I'm, I'm so, so ecstatic that I've made, that I'm able to say that. Now let's start adding to the CV, you know, let's go to Worlds and try and win a Worlds medal. Let's go to Commies and try and win a few Commies medals, you know, see see how, let's, let's try giving the 200 IM a crack again, you know, bring that back in. I haven't done that in a good few years and see what that's saying, you know, let's try the 100 free and, play around a bit with the relays and, and just bring that excitement and that motivation back. And, and it's, it's such a fortunate position to be in whereby everything's now a bonus. Now that I've mm. got that Olympic gold, it's like, that's, I've done the headline. Let's start adding to this, to the CV. And, and, and that's the way I look at it now. It's like, um, pressure's on because you're Olympic champion, but also pressure's mm. off because you're Olympic champion. Yeah. Like you've yeah, done it. <laughs> yeah. Literally, literally it, it is a bit, it, it is a little bit like that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to touch upon your summer's racing in a very 
quick moment. But first, I, I want to touch upon the squad at Bath because we've had plenty of them on this podcast. Mm. And it would be great to know kind of the the squad there and the training partners. Does that kind of bring the confidence out in not just you, basically the whole squad, because you are all training with the best in British swimming mm. up there, especially the the two free. I think it was like almost all of you are from the Bath Centre. Yeah. Bar Duncan. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant training group under a great coach in some incredible facilities in one of the most beautiful cities in the UK. Um, mm. Uh, I, I do do love this love this part of the world. I did uh, the holding camp for the Commonwealth Games was in Loughborough, and okay. Loughborough's great Different and everything. <laughs> Loughborough's great and everything. I'm sure everyone loves it up there. But honestly, it made me. And this is not. I'm not bad mouthing Loughborough at all. But I would lo- rather you know be down here training in Bath because it's a really really people people come on holiday to Bath for a reason. It's mm. such a great place, and the uni is great. The STV, the sports training village, is brilliant. Uh, but the group is incredible. So. Um, yeah, we've got a really, really great working relationship with everyone in the group. And because um, uh, the, uh, Joel, the other coach who was at Bath, he left, you know, about a year ago, the two groups came together and we made this like super group of like 15 people, 15, 16 people, which was like kind of unheard of in a national sense. We normally have like six or eight in a group and that's all the coach, but, you know, it, it's coaching, but they've had this big, big group. We've lost a few now. Unfortunately, Callum Jarvis, you know, a great 200 freestyler, world champion, Olympic champion, really, really great guy. He's no longer uh, training with us in Bath anymore. So, you know, we, we, we've we lost him, unfortunately, but we've still got a really great group. And for me personally, my closest training partner is obviously James Guy. And he's mm-hmm. someone that I've just gone head to head with so many times in training. We push each other on. He's done incredible things in his own right. 200 free, 100 fly, 400 free, you know, an amazing, amazing athlete. You look at his CV of times, you know, there aren't many athletes that can say they've done those kind of times. And the training, especially in the lead up to the Olympics that we were doing, like the head to heads we were doing, like I was dropping times that I've never, ever done before, you know, and it was only because we were really pushing each other on and under the the coaching eye of Dave McNulty, you know, who's now I'm pretty sure, I mean, undoubtedly the most successful British coach ever you know he 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 achieved 46 international medals from this summer of racing from those three meets which is incredible so it's it's like all these great forces have come together in 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 a brilliant facility and it's such a positive group and you've got people who are like just gunning to make a commies and that would be you know that'd be brilliant for them you've got you've got people who obviously like winning medals um like myself jimmy frey you know winning these these world level medals um and i think having that spectrum is great because it, it, it kind of it pulls people up it keeps people grounded it, it's a real real great working group well should we talk about dave for a little bit because his success really does speak for itself as you've just said like the countless medals that he's won um mm. we think he should be given more credit to the point where mm. he should be on a future honors list would you agree with that yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. i think it's a tragedy that he's not been named in any honors lists mm. yeah mm. yeah it's ridiculous how, much- how good he is how much confidence does he give for the whole squad knowing that he's in your corner, he's the one writing the sets, he's the one preparing you for races. The fact that he's been through this so many times, I think, I can't remember how many Olympics in a row he's got on medalist. It's, it's ridiculous. Mm. So I think I think this world was his 21st consecutive year on the international coaching stage um, for, for GB, which is brilliant. And I think you've just got to look at his CV really as an athlete to take confidence in his programme because not only has he achieved... You know, he's achieved Commonwealth Champions, World Champions, Olympic Champions. He's done it men's swimming, wind swimming, uh, sprinting, every single stroke, mm. long distance, you know, relays, individual medley, like any anything and everything he's got an accolade to his name for. And I think that just shows uh, the calibre of coach that he is. You know, and when you're a young athlete, when I joined Bath, I was like, there's no one else I wanted to coach me other than that guy because I was like, oh, I can't wait to tap into that fountain of knowledge. I can't wait to be part of his programme. And my mindset was always... All I've got the easy job. All I've got to do is turn up, do the session that's written, hit the times, the heart rates that are asked of me, and go home, and then do it again in the afternoon, and then do it the following day and the following day. You know, he's got the hard job. He's got to write all the, the, the complex sessions to get the best out of us. I've just got to rock up and commit myself fully to the Dave McNulty program. So, no, I think I think a lot of athletes take take massive confidence, not only in his coaching style, but his presence in the arena as well is something that's unparalleled. And I think you rarely get a coach that has both. And I've given talks in the past 
he got inducted into the University of Bath Hall of Fame, actually, Sporting Hall of Fame. I spoke about, you know, he's got this presence in, in um, a training environment and he's got a brilliant coaching ethos, but it's his, it's his arena skills that I think no coach can quite match. You know, he's walked me up for countless races and he always walks up to the cool room and, you know, he says his last few, you know, words of wisdom and he always says he can, like, look in your eye and see whether you're, you're, you're ready to go, see whether an athlete's going to grow in the arena or, or crumble in that environment. And I remember him, you know, he walked me up to that 203 Olympic final and I remember him just saying, you're ready, this is yours for the taking and that's all I needed to hear. And because we have such a, such a close relationship and such a strong working relationship that when someone with that much knowledge of the sport has that much faith in you, you know, it gives you a, an extra degree of confidence you didn't think you could find. You know, it's, it's to the point where he predicted two years prior the exact time I was going to go, you know, in that 203, you know, he said, mm. you will go a 144 that year and, you know, that can win the Olympics, you know. And I remember when I heard that from him, if I heard it from some random Joe on the street, I'd be like, well, you don't know, the, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, it could be, you know, chatting nonsense. But someone who's had Olympic medalists and world champions and, and athletes of, of all ranges and seen them fully develop when he said that, it's like, wow, that really means something, you know. So you'd never see yourself moving away from Bath then because you always want to be under Dave McNulty's guidance? Absolutely, yeah. No, I'll be, I'll be coached by Dave McNulty for my whole career. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's very happy to hear that. Um, yeah, should, we touch so. upon, <laughs> <laughs> should we touch upon last summer's racing then? Because there's a lot to get through. It was crazy. Um, as a whole, first of all, what were your thoughts on the summer? For you, kind of, well, I guess, was three major meets too much or did you find out a lot about yourself um i think you can't i think at least for the event schedule that i was doing you can't be at your best for three consecutive major meets i think it's too much i think it's too long of a period of time for a middle distance swimmer to be able to stay at their peak for that long um uh, whereby you can't maintain a high enough level of fitness missing out periods of work um, you know that the, the stretch that long. I think two two meets is definitely doable, um, and there's a case for a, a, a double taper um, or, or you know just maintaining the taper depending on the, the period of uh, time between them. For us, it was a, a build and then a descend again mm. in terms of workload and intensity. Um, it was a tough, tough, tough summer of racing, you know, and and not only was it three majors, but it was also you know I I did like. 12 races at world champs 13 at commonwealth games you know a, ri a rigorous racing schedule i did five at the olympics last year and i was i was spent at the end of it i was like gone because of the emotional and physical you know um effort that you exert in these races so for me to i was like look i want to push the boat as much as i can i want to try and do as many relays i want to do heat semis and finals of like the 100 free the 200 iron the 200 free i want to you know do a full caffeine on the evening for a 200 free final and then back it up with a 200 round heat the following morning because i need to see how far i can push myself in the lead up to paris and know whether i'm actually capable of doing all that so it was really really tough and by the time we got to europeans i was yeah i was spent and um <laughs> I was yeah I was gone and and that's why I didn't do the individual swims I focused purely on the relays out there uh, with the team and I just wanted to to wrap up my summer having had a, a you know good commies and worlds I wanted to wrap up with um just enjoying racing racing with the team out in out in that pool uh, in Rome so you've got a rough understanding of how Phelps was in Beijing then, give or take. Oh, goodness me, crazy! I can't, <laughs> honestly, it puts in perspective so much more. You know, I did twelve races. I think, or 13 races at Worlds and Commies. So that, that, that was my most, and I was, like, spent. I was done for. Uh, you know, and that was, like, I mean, what did I win? You know, obviously I won those medals at Commies, but I think I got, like, two bronzes at Worlds or something, a bronze in the 4 by 2 and a bronze in the 2 and a 3, and it was, like, I was, like, that was so, so tough. You know, it was brutal. He got eight Olympic gold medals, like, seven world mm -hmm. records, did 17 swims in Beijing, and it's just, like, that really, really puts in perspective. I mean, you, you hear stories about him walking from an Olympic, you know, gold medal podium position, walking straight into the cool room to do a, another semi-final or a final. It's just like, yeah, it, it's the more I race, the more I do these major competitions, the more respect I kind of gain for that yeah. feat. Yeah. yeah. What's your assessment of your own program going forward for major meets then? Because you said you tested the one, the two, the 200 IM, all kind of 
individually in their own rights look like they're going amazingly well but when you combine them into a, a major program mm. is it tough with all the relays alongside is it something you're looking to continue with all of them yeah it is tough there's a lot of factors at play because not only is it okay where are my swims how's my 200 free 200 i'm 100 free looking it's also okay what's the world of swimming looking the 200 mm. free right that's just gone astronomical hasn't it in the last the last few months you know this is stuff we've not seen in over a decade that's taken off, right? Let's look at the IM. Okay, well, we've got some, you know, this French swimmer who's burst onto the scene and is doing insane stuff in the, in, in the world of IM. The 100 free, the world record's just been broken. You know, I'm like, yeah. all, all of my events... <laughs> they're not just, easy events. No, they're really not. Seem to just hit the roof, which is which is a bit mental. But you do have to take into account, okay, well, what's the depth of, depth of athletes looking like in all these events? And then you have to think, right, well, what does... You know, what does my country ask of me? What relays are strong? Where am I going to be needed? Can we take, can I be rested for this heat? Or do we not have the option to rest, you know, um, in the heat of this relay? You know, what's the head coach of British Swimming going to say? You know, where does his um, opinions, you know, come into it? And, and these are conversations that I'm, I'm going to have with Dave literally in the next few weeks because we're going to plan my Worlds and Paris schedule in the next few weeks now that we're back in the new season and, and really start to look at how it plays out. I think there are... I think there are easy gains to be made for me. I think two hundred three is always going to be is always going to be in my schedule. That's undoubted. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my, I've got I like to think I've got a free star stroke that's made for two hundred three. I think there are easy gains to be made in my two hundred IM. You know, and I'm not a million miles off off meddling at Worlds. I think I was, you know, what was I one fifty six seven? I think, and people, boys were meddling one fifty five highs. I think something along those lines, you know, not a million miles off. Um, you know, 156 has won medals at pretty much every Olympics, I'm pretty sure, you know, on that 2IM. You know, someone within touching distance, and that's like with a backstroke that's pretty shoddy at the moment that, you know, needs quite a bit of work. So I think I think there are easy gains to be made there. The 100 free is an event I'm still learning, um, you know, and, and I'm really, really enjoying it. I, I, I broke through that 48 barrier down to the 47s at, at Commies, which was good fun. And... Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think it's just going to be a lot of interesting chats I'm going to have with Dave going forward. And I know that we'll both come to an agreement and we'll alter the entire training program to, to really focus on, on what's going to be asked of me in Worlds, but ultimately, you know, Paris 2024. Hmm. Well, it is just the one major next summer. And with a more hmm. standard training block and taper compared to the summer that's just gone, uh, are you hoping for stronger swims that will then bring you the confidence leading into Paris? One year out. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. You know, last year was like, right, let's just take three or four months off after the Olympics, which is just crazy. And all that craziness that was going on, let's chuck an ISL in there, you know, which means it's going to be just wreck that training block up to Christmas. You know, let's have all these commercial opportunities. I'm still trying to feel my way around, you know, in this world, you know, chuck in three chest infections over the course of the year, which never helps anything. And it's like mm. this training block all of a sudden goes from a full year getting shorter, getting shorter, getting shorter and disruption here. So it's like, I'm so happy to have a solid year ahead of me where, you know, I know where I lie in terms of commercial commitments and um, work outside of the pool and stuff like that. I, I understand that world now. There is no ISL, you know, there's a clean run. There's one major competition. We're going to do a standard build phase now, clean run into a winter meet, you know, a block, a block, a solid block of January, February, March work into trials. And then we've got the running into world champs. And then that will wrap up this year before we head to the, the, the Olympic year. So it's like a clean, normal, solid year, which is exactly what I need heading into, you know, next year's of training. Um, you know, these two years are just going to be just going to be a solid block. And, you know, it's going to be tough, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Sounds simple. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before we get on to one final big question about how you beat a certain swimmer, if it's even possible mm -hmm. right now, I've mm -hmm. got to ask, what was it like racing in Birmingham in front of a home crowd? Because you're our first guest on since the Commonwealth Games. Oh, really? You've raced there. Mm -hmm. What was it like in front of a home crowd? And should we potentially be pushing for more of these meets held in this country? Because the atmosphere at home certainly sounded a bit wild. That's, that's the most fun I've ever had at a swimming meet in my life. You know, that was... Really? It was incredible it was electric i absolutely loved it you know it took me about it took me about two swims to really be like you know get used to it a little bit because as an english swimmer you would walk out and the place would just erupt you know you'd put your hand up and wave to the crowd and the place would erupt if you won a medal mm. uh you know it would go crazy and then that, that relay on the last night where i was going head to head with yeah. Chalmers on that medley relay and we won by a few <laughs> hundreds 
and I had like I had like six silvers, and I was like, God, please, one gold would be nice, you know, out of these all these medals. And then finally, you know, to touch the wall on the last, literally the last swim of Birmingham, and to get the gold and then get on the lane rope, it was just like that holds such a special place for me in my in my memories of my swimming career. So that was brilliant. The best crowd I've ever swum in front of. Absolutely loved every second of it. The home support is amazing. You know, hopefully a lot of young swimmers are in that crowd. They could see swimmers from their nation winning medals, being competitive with the likes of Australia and you know New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, showing them what is possible um, when you make a, a career out out of this sport, and, and showing the excitement behind getting you know being part of Team England, wearing that flag, all that brilliant stuff that comes with representing your country. And, and I think it, it it would be a real tragedy if more competitions weren't hosted like that you know in this mm. country i think it's sad enough it is that the the london aquatic center gets used as little as it does you know such an incredible facility um mm. that that you know doesn't really get as much use as i think it should i think it should do because there is an appetite when mm. you put an exciting show on like birmingham you know you don't have to be a swimming fan to get behind team england you know that's why that's why mm. i think people don't quite understand you that you don't have to be you know everything about the sport swimming to really get excited about a relay you know look at those mixed relays you know we've got people coming ahead and going behind and it's us in australia and canada and i'm sure there are people in that crowd who entered the raffle just uh, you know really mm. wanted to get some home home tickets for a commonwealth games and they went and i'm sure they had the best the best night of of you know of their sport in live sport career because it's just so so cool so I had a brilliant time. I hope all the fans had a great time. It sounded like they did. And hopefully it starts to set the precedence for, you know, the kind of meets we can host on uh, on British soil in in the future. Yeah, we've got I a wish fair I was there for now, don't we? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I wish I was there for that final relay because I was literally <laughs> shouting at the telly. Like, Go on, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> Goodness me. It was crazy. He's, such a, he's got such a rapid back 50. Kyle, because mm. I remember like yeah. Jimmy was coming in on the fly and I was like, Oh, I know I'm going to go. I just am going to go head to head with him. Like literally, it's going to come down just to me and him. I've said it in like in one of the podcasts that I did, like on on the weekly freestyle on my podcast. It was like on relay. Normally, you're well far behind, but you know you're really far in front. If you're really far in front, you know you've got enough clear water. If you're far behind, you can give it a good crack. Try and get in the way. If you get them, it'd be cool. If not, no worries. But it's when you're head to head. And you've got all the guys watching. You know they've all put in brilliant swims, but it comes down literally. Your swim can make or break it. And I'm convinced you went past me with about 10 metres to go. And then I literally just swung that arm mm. around and I was like, just hope it hope it gets on the wall. So, um, yeah, that was crazy. That was really, that was really, really good fun. Hopefully yeah. that performance has uh, done you a favour going forwards as well. Because that four by medley relay team, the, the last leg, that anchor leg, is mm. it's kind of hard to get on. There's so many of you that could get picked for mm. it. Mm -hmm. And it's a really mm -hmm. strong team as well. So, I don't know, maybe that performance that you can hold off Chalmers has uh, put Hopefully. you in good stead going and going forward. Yeah, How absolutely. I think that? The, the, yeah, the interesting <laughs> thing is, um, and one thing I've learned now doing more relays this year, it's like you really need to, you almost need to stamp a good 100 free at the start of the meet because everyone's vying for a spot on that medley relay, you know. Mm. I want to be that guy who's anchoring the medley relay at, at Paris, you know, just as much as I'm sure Jacob Whittle, Duncan Scott, Lewis Burris, you know, all these guys also want to be doing that. So, you know, it's like, yeah, you got a bit of banter with your mates, you know, the other British guys, but at the end of the day, you're fighting it out for a spot on that relay because it's so competitive. <laughs> and it's like, I've been tested a few times. I've never, I'd never swum an ankle leg on a relay till this summer, yeah. you know, doing doing it at Worlds and Commies. Um, but then, uh, you know, and I used to be pretty petrified of swimming ankle legs. You know, I used to really had like a bit of a mental block. I was like, look, I, Jimmy's so good at it. Jimmy's anchored four by two so many times. Duncan's mm. great at it. But you have to do your first one at some point. You know, this was the summer for it. And I was like, you know what? Actually, I really started to enjoy swimming that anchor leg, you know, because I do find that extra boost. I dropped the 143.5, 143.5 mm. on that 200 free anchor leg on the 4x2 at Wells, which I was chuffed with, you know. And, and, <laughs> it, and then that 47, no, I think I dipped down to the 46s, actually. 46.9 46 yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. On, so on the other anchor. So it's like, I'm really loving swimming that anchor leg. And I, I'm, like you said, hopefully it holds me in good stead for the future. Yeah, I would never complain about a 143 and a 203. Jeez. Yeah, I'll but take that. <laughs> the problem is you have someone going a 142.9. So we we've got to talk about him. How do you mm -hmm. go about beating David Popovich in Paris? It is, it's the question on everyone's mind, isn't it, really? I think, um, I think it's been interesting because I've seen clips 
Uh, I was actually speaking to Dave about it. Literally, yes, I've seen clips of his swims. I've seen underwater clips. I've been able to, you know, take a few mental notes. But you know, Dave's not watched him fully properly yet. I've not fully, you know, there hasn't been a full breakdown of his stroke, and we both haven't analysed how he races or anything like that. Um, as in, Dave and I haven't done the analysis yet. Um, so I think it's it's something that we're definitely definitely looking to do I think look there's no denying it he has blown the two and the three and the under three out of the water you know no one no one can come close to him he's done stuff that hasn't been done like I said for over a decade I mean I was watching his two and the three at Europeans um, and it just reminded me so much of Phelps's Beijing two and the three you know 142.9 his stroke is so similar how he gets out the water I think I saw that video on Instagram where it was like you know getting his whole head out the water um, chatting about that it was like he's got a, he's got a stroke where he holds so much water he catches so early which I think I'm okay I'm you know that's one of my strengths but he's so good at accelerating He's, he holds the water right past the midpoint and then accelerates back with it, which is so hard to... That's something that Duncan's brilliant at, you know, that, that back-end acceleration in the freestyle stroke, and he's able to really bring the two together. Um, you know, he, 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 he accelerates in and out of turns, which is something that mm. is really tough to do, you know. You know, normally you kind of back off, he, he ramps up heading into the turn. And I was watching his, two, I was watching his under three at Europeans, and it's like, it gets to 20 metres to go, and it looks like he, he just drops these guys like it's a, a county meet or something you know just takes <laughs> off and just like aquaplanes over the water um yeah i think he's just got he's got a brilliant brilliant freestyle stroke he's clearly an incredible athlete you know he's, he's doing great things in the world of freestyle swimming um but you know how who who's to say whether this is just the beginning this is his peak you know is he gonna just do things astronomical is he going to be you know the phelps of our of our generation um you know these are chats that i've had with 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 loads of people you know you, you just can't say at this point he is so young he's gone so quickly at such a young age it's it's really going to be interesting to to uh, to watch his development um you know he just happens to be rapid at two and a three you know why can't it be rapid at like 100 back or something <laughs> yeah. i mean there's, there's world records getting broken all over the place and all oh, 100 back right did go now. 100 back did yeah. go didn't it yeah check on yeah. of course yeah god yeah i'm trying it's to think crazy so Absolutely when everything. you're looking at him you aren't like you are obviously you're seeing it as a rival but you're also taking it away as inspiration and you're breaking down his stroke for the little minutiae that can really help you mm. Mm. absolutely you know i think any 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 person who's passionate about the sport of swimming will, will take away loads of positives from his stroke. Um, you know, really be able to break it down and, and, and see the, the, the beauty of that freestyle stroke. Um, obviously, I still see him, you know, I'm still always going to see him as a competitor. You know, we're, we shared a podium at World Champs. Um, you know, we, we've raced multiple times throughout this year. Um, I, you know, I know it's going to come down to us going head to head in Paris all over again, you know, in that two and a three. It's just the way it's going to go um, because. We're so close, you know. I I had I've got the fastest time in the world from the Olympics, apart from one guy, you know, and mm. and and it's him. So we, you know, I like to think we'll have plenty more head to heads in the future. Um, but yeah, you know, I look at all I look at all swimmers. You know, I'm watching guys like Brody here in Bath. You know, I'm always watching his backstroke whenever we're training. I'm always watching his backstroke. I'm trying to figure out his catch, trying to figure out because I need to I need to improve that in my in my IM, you know, so I'm watching Jimmy's fly, you know, he skips over the water so well in his under fly. I'm trying to take that into my IM swimming, you know, I'm watching Popovich's um, freestyle stroke and I'm trying to, you know, it's, you take the positives from loads of people, you draw them, you draw them away and, you know, I might leave some things that these people aren't as strong at, you know, and I know that you can see both. So, um, yeah, I think any any passionate swim fan and, and, and you know, swimming athlete, who really wants to still improve themselves uh, is is trying to do just that. And and for myself, you know, you caught me at a moment where it's pre, it's pre season at the moment. You know, this mm. is when our strokes are the most malleable. You know, because we've completely lost the feel for the water, so we're building it back up. So, you know, I'm doing a session. We had a few 400s aerobic tonight, and I'm thinking, right, left hand accelerate on that back end of the stroke. You know, because now's the time to start laying that groundwork. Mm. I think that's a brilliant message for any younger swimmers or any younger people listening right now that even an Olympic champion looks to other people racing, even though they aren't Olympic mm -hmm. champions themselves, and taking a positive out of everyone else. I think that's brilliant. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. 
need to check out Dan's uh, Dan's done a breakdown of his stroke. <laughs> full, <laughs> full 15 oh, minutes of it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just a bit of a shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I think that's a really good place to end it. We've talked about so much, how the world has changed for you, and um, hopefully things keep on going. Hopefully there's more success mm. on the horizon, and we cannot wait to uh, follow the rest of your career. Thank you very much. Yeah, the trajectory looks pretty good right now, I must say, with, you know, <laughs> dropping 143s in relays. The 200 IM, I think, is the same as you. I think you're going to see a 155 pretty soon. So, yeah, best of luck. I think Worlds is going to be a, a good gauge to see how Paris goes, I think. Absolutely. Cheers for that, guys. Thank you very much. So that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And me and Dan will be back next week. Yeah, thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.